back to my channel. Thanks guys for tuning in. This is going to be part one of two in this interview. During the recording of this process, not only did I realize that I was recording in presenter mode instead of panel mode for the interview purpose, but we went way over time with just sharing and really getting into what the birth experience was like pre and post pandemic. Um, so again, it's going to be in two parts and forgive any glitches or technical difficulties because of the fact that it is recorded in presenter mode and not in um, panel mode. Either way, again, this is going to be part one and part two is going to be coming shortly behind. Um, there's a lot of information to unpack. And I Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning into my channel. Today, I'm doing an interview. As you can see, I have my lovely sister-in-law, Shandell, and my lovely another sister-in-law, or my cousin-in-law, Jasmine, here. Um, they're both moms. Um, Shandell has two children, and Jasmine has three. They're on today to really talk about kind of pre- and post-pandemic. You know, that's what's really popular right now, and especially going from being first-time moms, which they were both first-time moms pre-pandemic, and now kind of having that whole childbirth, antepartum, um, postpartum experience, post-pandemic or during the pandemic, because we're still in a pandemic, um, we're just going to run through some questions and really hear firsthand from these lovely ladies. So, you know, first question, what type of provider did either of you have, or each of you have, for your pregnancy? Um, Pre-COVID, with our firstborn, um, I had a my OBGYN, it was a guy, it was in Nebraska. Um, and then I stuck with him um, from beginning to end. He was my OBGYN before I got pregnant. Um, then when we moved to Virginia, I had to find someone. And so I had a midwife and OBGYN. I had to meet every single one, every appointment. So that was my whole nine months. <laughs> so I had, I went back and forth. So for me, my experience was more like Chandel's post pandemic for both pre and post pandemic. So since I'm military, this military installation anyway, um, you always see a different provider who's ever available, you see them because if it's a military provider, they can get an assignment and be gone your next appointment. So each appointment I saw someone different. I didn't know who was going to be delivering my children any of the times, any of the three pregnancies. Um, so I was just familiar with whatever providers I saw. Most of the time they were OBGYN. I had a combination of military and civilian OBGYNs. And I've also seen midwives as well. Me and Chandel had been talking about this previously, but I definitely wanted to pose this as kind of like a sub question to that. Um, something that we talk about in midwifery school um, is continuity of care. So it's like, or closed circle communication. So Chandel and I were discussing how every appointment, you have to kind of repeat all your history all over and over and over again. So um, would you say that you felt like your provider was knowledgeable before your appointments or did you find yourself kind of repeating yourself over and over at every appointment? Pre-COVID, pre um, my provider was the same guy. So he was, I mean, he was on the ball with everything. He, hey, what's going on? You know, we can just talk and stuff. And it was, it just flowed so smoothly. And um, you know, being here, um, I don't know if it's because of COVID or not, but it was everybody that came in the room. It's like, you're meeting everybody for the first time, but it's still, they know nothing about you. So you have to like, you know, repeat yourself, but literally almost probably everything. Like they'll, you know, go on the computer and, oh, okay. So I saw this or I saw that. And sometimes you're like, well, did you see this or did you see that? And you're like, oh no, well, well tell me about it. And so now you're like, tell me about it, about every, you know, for every, appointment so I guess that was probably one of the most stressful things you're just repeating yourself every appointment I agree so post pandemic um I would say week 37 or 38 I actually did have one really good uh civilian OBGYN and he came into the room and he was saying hey I know this this and that I know you've seen this you've dealt with that and I was like really shocked like oh my gosh he actually knows he read my record which I expect everyone to do but this time he actually read, he took the time, he knew who I was. And so I took less time um, during my visit to explain my situation. On the other hand, I can say that this time around post pandemic, I actually had one provider who, because I was seeing different providers every time, 
I saw her for the first time and, you know, each person's hands are different. So when they're doing measurements, things can be off. And so this time I saw her and she did, she measured my stomach. And so of course she's measuring the fetus, seeing how, how much um, she's grown um, since the last appointment, if she's uh, where she should be during that week. And I was about at week 31 or maybe 20, between 28 and 31. Um, and so she says, well, she's really small. Has anyone told you she was small? I'm, I'm a petite female. And so all of my children are pretty small. And so I said, no, she, sent, she tends to be about two to three weeks in advance, actually. Um, are you measuring her small this time? And so she says, yeah, she's measuring pretty small. So we'll write you a referral and we'll send you over to maternal fetal medicine. So here I am panicking, like, oh my gosh, my baby's too small. What's going on? What's wrong with me? Like, I keep checking my weight. My weight's increasing. Everything seems to be fine. And so how is my baby so small? And so um, I'm like stressing and she's like, well, don't worry about it. If she's too small, we'll just induce your labor early. And so that made me start stressing even more. Like, no, I don't, I'm too soon. And how did she just become small all of a sudden? And so, of course, I went over to maternal fetal medicine and I had a growth scan. Turns out she was fine. And they said, no, this is going to be your biggest baby. But I think had I had the same provider, that provider would have known me, would have known, okay, this is the size of the baby. The baby wasn't small. I don't know. Yeah, if I think I'm going to chime in on that part. Um, I, I was about 31 weeks pregnant and I met this, I met a new, I believe she was a midwife and she measured my stomach and she looked at me. And I looked at her and she's like, then she went back to the computer and she was like, you're measuring, you know, ahead. And I was like, you know, what do you mean? Like how far? And um, I know the appointment before the doctor said I was measuring her head, but I measured her head, but I forgot um, how far along, but it wasn't too crazy. But this doctor or this midwife, she's like, you're measuring about 35 weeks. And I said, 35, I was 31 weeks measuring 35 weeks. And that just sounded so crazy to me because I just, you know, I was just here two weeks ago. And um, I think, again, because maybe, you know, it's a different person every time. And I don't even know, she could have been positioned a different way or something. But, you know, that was like, I was stressed out. because I'm like, well, you know, I don't want have, to have to have a C-section. I don't want them to induce me. Like, you just start thinking so many things just because of this one, you know, it could have just been an off day, like Jasmine said. Um, so I went to get a... Um, ultrasound and the ultrasound text is like I don't know what they're talking about she's fine you know she's measuring perfectly fine and she's not that big so because yeah that, I think it's very important for you to be familiar with your patients to know you know what exactly you're expecting when you look because of course we learn all these things it's like any industry you learn from the industry standard however when you're dealing in bodies you, there's no standard so you know the first thing we had to do was actually take measurements of our hands because you know you're checking someone you need to know like what what does it correlate to on your hands what your two centimeters 10 centimeters whatever I know there was one person it's just such a striking image like okay if you want to check someone in there two centimeters you know you you put your fingers in to touch the cervix and then some people you know their two centimeters is this then you have some people who has like four centimeters I mean six centimeters excuse me is like you know like this when they're touching but I remember there was a petite lady and she's like oh yeah you know when I measure 10 centimeters I measure it like this and I'm like oh like hello like you're just reaching in there and you're measuring it and it's like you just have to, you have to know yourself as the provider and then your differences. And we do also discuss in class as well about how almost everything has a toll on your psyche when you're pregnant, because you're not even thinking for just one person. You know, oftentimes you're putting yourself down in order to make sure your baby's safe and you, you're thinking, oh, can I provide this? How can I provide that? Um, so is very, you're not alone in what you're even experiencing. It's definitely something that um, you hear a lot about and you read a lot about. And so I thank you guys for sharing that. And then that kind of ties into my next question for both of you. You know, really quickly, I know there's probably a laundry list, but what's the biggest thing that you think that you would change about um, your provider? So I would like to, like you said, a smaller practice. I would definitely like to find maybe a smaller practice around here. Um, I don't know if they, I don't know if I, could or not but I like the personal 
the one-on-one, the you know me, I know you kind of thing. The I I can talk freely. I don't have to be like, oh, mm, well, you know, like I don't like to. Okay, how should I say this? Like, no, I just want to look, this is what's going on, blah, 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 blah. And I want the doctor to be like, oh, okay, so we can do this, we can do that and not be like standoffish or kind of cold or I'm just a new, you know, I'm just a next patient kind of thing in and out. Um, yeah, I would, I would definitely like to find someone where, or someone who I can, I'll see every time I go to the I doctor. agree. If I could have just one provider, the entire pregnancy, that would just be great. And someone who I could like, they said, be open and someone who is compassionate and they understands what's going on. If you don't know, because I know no one's perfect. So no doctor, OBGYN, midwife is going to be perfect or know everything. If you don't know it, say, I'm not certain. Let me get back to you. Or, hey, let's research this some more to find out exactly what's going on with you. Don't guess. Don't make me think there's an issue when there's not really an issue. Uh, but just be open with me. And so I can be open with you as well. And I think that's just so important based off of the fact that, again, you really, as a pregnant person, you're really the environment, like your child is within you. So every little thing, stress, you know, concern, it affects, you know, some people when you're stressed, you can't really eat and then you're already pregnant and you might be having a food aversion, you know, you might be smelling something. You're like, oh, I already can't eat, but then you're stressed out. Then you're like, okay, I need to eat something for baby. Then you're like, oh my gosh, am I going to vomit after I eat this? There's so many things that go along with it. And again, I really understand exactly how you could fall on the idea of continuity of care and having that closed circle communication and making sure that, you know, those are the type of providers that are going to be able to know what's going on. And hopefully if you guys decide to have more kids, that's something that you can find. It does sometimes take a little bit of shopping, but hopefully that's something that you guys can find. And now I kind of want to transition a little bit onto just education, because like I said, there's no real way to just be super prepared for birth, but did you feel like you were adequately prepared for the act of giving birth itself? And I mean, specifically the birth part, <laughs> did you feel like you were adequately prepared? I think, I think I was prepared, prepared for both. Um, you know, you don't, I wasn't prepared for the pain, no, but um, I do think I was pre prepared um, pretty well for the act of, um, you know, giving birth to a child, um, just knowing like, okay, you know, my body is going to do what my body wants to do when it happens, you know, I can't stop her from, you know, I, I can't stop her from, you know, coming out. I can't stop, I can't stop the pain, you know, it's going to happen. Um, I think going into it without um, a, a lot of expectations was a, a big thing for me. Um, I know I did the YouTube videos, I did the classes, I did everything, you know, they can tell you uh, you know, they can give you a laundry list from A to A through Z, but once you're in active labor, that's like a whole different ball game. And, you know, it's just taking it slow. I think preparing myself, like, okay, it's, it's going to happen. Just breathe and let's write it out kind of thing. So I think I was prepared. Um, but I, I, I don't, I think I was prepared because I prepared myself. I wouldn't say that it was because my doctor, um, or midwife, like, okay, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, or talk me through different things. Um, I think that all was because of me. Yeah. I think overall, I was prepared, I would say easier as you have more children. Of course, the first time you read, you don't know what you don't know. Um, so I'll give you an example. My first time, I, I didn't have contractions. My water just broke. I was at home. I was doing my work. I was working from home and I was bouncing on my exercise ball. My water broke. And so I knew it was go time. So I called my husband and um, let him know, hey, it's time to go. My water broke. I knew what it was. I knew my water was breaking. And so I told him it was time to go. We already had the bags packed. And then here's my mistake. I jumped in the shower. <laughs> Because I remember everyone telling me, hey, don't get to the hospital too early because once you're tied down to that bed, you can't move, you can't eat. So just take your time getting to the hospital. Little did I know they meant if you were having contract, it's not if your water broke. 
And so here I am with my water breaking. I jumped in a shower so I could uh, get ready. And then my sister-in-law actually told me, hey, get out of that shower, get the towels and you have to go. And here I'm thinking, well, I'm not having contractions. Maybe I'll have to wait a little while. So I'll say it's a combination of reading things and then your family also being there to let you know what you didn't know that you thought you knew about um, the childbirth experience. So I'll, we also took um, Lamaze classes with the first one. And I think that helped me a lot with my breathing. And so when I was panicking, when the contractions got stronger with him, um, Kosi was right there and telling me, hey, breathe. And then he would count my breaths for me as so I would breathe slowly through it. And I think that got me through most of the time um, because I wanted to get through without an epidural. After about 21 hours, I decided to just go ahead and get it because I didn't know when this child was going to come. And I just felt those contractions, but I still thought I did pretty good. And even with the second two, I knew, okay, I had these classes. Um, I knew what it felt like that first time. So let me continue trying these breaths, not to panic and just breathe through it. And I think that helped me out a lot. So just a combination of reading, like Shandell said, doing YouTube videos, having family there and that Lamaze class that also helped me out a lot. I'm glad you guys talked about kind of the education materials because I definitely wanted to get into that. But really as a quick sidebar, because um, a lot of people say this, but did either of you experience that feeling where, you know, as Jasmine, you just mentioned 21 hours is when you got your epidural. So obviously the labor was longer than that. But did you ever have a feeling either first baby or a second baby where you just felt like you could not do it. Like, okay, the baby's just gonna have to stay in here. Like, I just feel, you know, can you like explain that a little bit? Um, I didn't feel that with Glory, but with Aubrey, you know, I don't know. We went to the hospital like eight in the morning and we were there. Um, I went because I was, you know, leaking. Um, I, I thought it was amniotic fluid, but it, they said it wasn't. Um, but they just admitted me because I was already like six centimeters dilated. Um, and my body, like I, I couldn't even tell you what happened. Like my energy was drained. Like I had no energy at all by like 5 p.m. I, I just laid there and just closed my eyes. <laughs> like I couldn't even, even the act of pushing, I had to, I had no, I had nothing in me. Like, I was just like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how I'm gonna push her out. Cause I, I cannot keep pushing. Like, I don't know. Like even just to breathe in took so much out of me. Right. So we went to the hospital the first time because I had contractions. I get there and they told me, no, your contractions aren't strong enough. And I was like sitting on that bed crying. Like, okay, this baby is ready. And they're like, no, not strong enough. And they were closer together, but they just weren't strong enough. So they said it wasn't time for him to come. And I wasn't dilating. So they sent me back home. And when they sent me back home, I was like, okay, when can I come back? Like, when can I just have him? <laughs> because these contractions are too strong. They're hurting. It has to be time. And so they said, well, it could be a week, could be a few hours. You just never know. I said, there's no way I'm going to work. And I'm just going to deal with these contractions for another week. And so we get home and I was literally vomiting, just sick, the sickest I've ever been in my life when I got home. Um, a few hours passed and my water broke. And so to me, I could have just stayed in the hospital and had him. Um, but I got back to the hospital and it wasn't the fact that it wasn't a thought of, no, I can't do this. But as soon as I got there, I was ready. I was like, I don't know if I was, I was a little upset because they sent me home still and I was in more pain and I was sick that time. So as soon as I went there, I was in triage and I just told her, I'm like, I'm back. He's ready to come. My water broke this time. I'm having contractions. They're strong. They're close together. Don't send me back home. And she's like, okay, did you think about a, um, epidural? And I was like, now I need it. <laughs> And so I guess the thought of not being able to do it without an epidural that time was definitely on my mind because I'm like, give it to me now. I'm not trying without it. Just give it to me so he can get out of me. Come on. I need to see this baby boy. And then um, with Bree, it was more so before I even got to the childbirth, I was telling Shandell one time because we were texting often and having, having phone calls. I was texting Shandell and I said, I just had a doctor's appointment and I don't know if I can do this. 
because that check, I forgot about the checks and that check was just so uncomfortable. And I said, I don't know how she's gonna come, but I can't do this. <laughs> I don't want another check. I don't know how I'm gonna push her. I just don't know how I had two children already and I can't get through this check. So I just, I didn't know how I was gonna do it. <laughs> I think I'll piggyback off of the, the checks. Um, when I went to the hospital um, the morning before, or the morning that I had, well, when I was in labor, um, with Aubrey, you know, every nurse that came to check me, it, I was just like, can you please, like, it just hurt so bad. And I was like, I don't remember when I went to my doctor's appointments, it didn't hurt that much, but this time around, it's like, they were just like, like elbow deep. It was just I was like, please, like this, it, the more every, every nurse, I was just like, can you please just, just be gentle, please. Like, it just hurt more and more. So I definitely feel you on that one. Well, one thing I want to chime in, do you know that checks, and hopefully I'm telling the viewers, I'm telling you guys for any future children, checks are optional. Just another sidebar that I wanted to throw in there because I instantly started thinking, you know, I have a video on it, but did either of you have a birth plan for any babies? Um, okay, so... The first child, I didn't know that the checks were optional, but I didn't get checked um, until maybe like 39 weeks or so. Um, and then once active labor, start, active labor started, every nurse that came, they checked me. Um, but this time around, I did know, I, had a, I actually had a doula um, and she was very informational. I would say before I got admitted, I was, those nurses, before I got, it was just, I was like, can you please, you know, like just be gentle now every other nurse after I got admitted didn't check me but um the one that was there during while I was giving birth um to Aubrey she did she checked me maybe like twice but I didn't know that they were optional um I did not I did have a birth plan with Glory I didn't have a birth plan with Aubrey because I remember with Glory it just kind of went right out the window you know so now I'm just kind of like okay if this is what I want to do then I'll do that but like I have a plan but also remember that sometimes things don't go as planned so um keeping those both thoughts in, in my mind like okay this is what I want to do you know I want to if I want to walk around I want to walk around um you know if hey I just need some music playing then like I know I can do these things but at the same time just not have you know these don't restrain myself um on certain things and like think like oh I didn't do this and or be mad at myself for not following my plan so that's pretty much kind of how I went about it. I had a birth plan with Brody. It wasn't like as detailed. Um, and then when I had Brie, I did not have a birth plan. I went there. I was like, okay, if I need an epidural, I'll get it. I'm not a failure if I get an epidural. <laughs> and then I just really, I was just like, okay, I just want to get through and be safe. Um, not have like, not walk in the hospital COVID free and walk out with COVID basically, because you know, we're in a pandemic this time around. And so that was like my biggest stressor for this pregnancy. Um, but I was also more educated this time around because of course I did have the other two babies. And so this time, although I didn't have a birth plan, I knew I wanted to go as long as I could without the epidural once again. Um, so I was asking about the ball and the first time I knew the ball was available. Well, I knew it should have been available, but I was told, no, I couldn't get it. And I was told no a lot the first time, although I had a plan. Um, but after talking with more people after my first pregnancy and like going through that pregnancy and my second one, I knew what was available. I asked more questions about the hospital right. and to see more things earlier on instead of waiting until I was actually in labor. And so I was able to use the ball this time around and wait. I say all that to say that I actually did get rushed towards the end. And so I told you with her, well, I don't know if I said it or not during this interview, but with Brie, I went in because I was having contractions. My contractions started about 3 p.m. Um, and they were mild contractions. I felt them, but I knew they weren't strong. Um, and then they were inconsistent. So I just waited along. Um, and then they got closer together. They weren't really that strong, but they were getting closer together. So I felt like, okay, maybe it could be time for her to come. And I got to the hospital. They checked me. I was, I think I was three three centimeters dilated or so. And so they asked me if I wanted to walk around. 
um, to see if she would be moving anymore to see if my labor was progressing. And so we walked around for about an hour or so. And then we came back and he said, I, I dilated a little bit further, but still like nothing major. And so they gave me an option of either staying and possibly getting induced or going home. And so I told him, I said, well, what are the options? Like what happens if I stay and get induced? Cause I hadn't been really induced before. So what, what does this mean to me? Cause I didn't think about that before in my birth plans in the past, I just thought, okay, my, all my plans were more so if I didn't have to get induced, I guess, best case scenario. I didn't plan for, okay, plan B, plan C, if I get induced, what can happen? Or if this part doesn't work, what happens? And so um, he did say, I might have to get induced if I stayed then because I wasn't um, dilated any further well, that quickly. And so we talked about everything, talked about the balloon, talked about a whole bunch of different options. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to stay because I feel like she's ready. And so we stayed and this doctor was the same doctor who he was there for maybe the first two or three hours um, because the shift changed. So he was there. And I think as he, as it was time for him to leave, he started trying to rush me through it. And so um, he said, okay, we could check you again. And he checked me and he said, okay, it's still not ready, but um, the Pitocin is working. The contractions are getting stronger. She's just not ready to come. I'm like, okay, fine. And he said, well, do you want to get the epidural? I said, no, I think I'm fine now. And then he's like, well, if we have to um, do any other methods, then it might be too late to get the epidural later. And I was like, okay. I know how I felt before. I don't want it to get too late. And I said, you know what? Just give me an epidural. And at that point, I felt like all of my choices were taken away. But I got the epidural because I wanted to make sure that if they had to do a C-section or anything, like I was covered, I was good to go. And I wanted to make sure I didn't actually have to get that C-section. Right. Well, first, I have to say I'm so sorry. And I... I something that we read a lot about and that, that I'm currently learning about now is um, like different types of birth trauma. And it, it's any kind of aversion from like the beautiful, spiritual, deep physical connection that you have, you know, while you're going through the process of being or giving birth, because, you know, it's such it's such a vulnerable time, you know, you're really trusting and you're really kind of, even though I, as we said, you know, plans are important, you, you do have to kind of give way to the person that is your, you know, your provider. So I just, I'm so sorry that that happened to you because a, a lot of times I find in research that certain things are done and it's like, okay, this is the job. Like this is the, the um, provider trying to make sure that the birth happens on their watch, basically. So it, it, it's unfortunate that that had to happen. I'm so sorry, but- Well, I really felt that I wanted to unpack a little bit of what Jasmine was explaining about feeling rushed throughout her- childbirth experience and the literature is out there um birth trauma traumatic birth experiences it's all subjective um and it's real uh it's real in the moment and it can be avoided um in her situation, I won't say in every situation, things are not always going to go how you plan, how we talked about birth plans, but certain things and definitely what she expressed as feeling rushed, those things can be and should be avoided. I'm not going to speak ill to her provider. Um, would I have done something like that? No, but sometimes you get caught up as a provider in a big, busy practice um, to progress the labor along to fit in with a timeline that doesn't necessarily fit in with baby's timeline or mom's timeline. And in some situations, that's necessary. It doesn't sound like that was necessary for Jasmine's situations, and I don't believe that it was necessary for Jasmine's situation. But because that was such... Um, 
a heavy thing, I definitely wanted to just let it sit and leave you guys to ponder that and understand why we have to be our, our own advocates. Um, you don't know the things that you don't know. And a lot of times, especially first time moms don't necessarily know and you're expecting your provider to tell you a lot of things. Um, as we talk about in part two, which I'm not going to tell too much because I do want you to watch it. Um, it's about becoming an active participant in your own healthcare experience. I am going to leave it on that note and I'll see you guys over on part two.